uh, this gathering event is an opportunity to celebrate both RCSI's past, its present, and its future. And I think, as the Minister has said, really the entirety of Irish higher education and healthcare. For me and my colleagues, it's an opportunity to look back at the aspirations and ambitions of our founders and to see what lessons we can learn from our history, our over 200 year history. How does an organization go from little more than a vision with absolutely no money <laughs> to an international health sciences institution with over 20,000 alumni from 70 countries with universities, colleges, and training establishments in five different time zones. In the RCSI Dublin campus alone, we have 956 full-time staff, nearly 5,000 postgraduate and undergraduate students. We've increased our international students' numbers by 9% in the last two years alone. But if we go back, for most of the 18th century, surgeons belonged to the Guild of Surgeons and Barbers, established in 1446 by Henry VI, and it was an uncomfortable alliance, to say the least. <laughs> uh, special interest there. <laughs> um, despite many attempts by the surgeons to change training, introduce professionalisms, they were always outvoted by the barbers who outnumbered them. Furthermore, Surgery was not seen as a fit discipline for the university medical schools. The first person with credit for documenting the need for a college of surgeons goes to Sylvester O'Halloran. And I think his own story says a lot about the aspirations and the background of our founders. Born in Limerick and Cahir Davin, as a Catholic, he was not permitted to enter the university in Dublin. However ambitious, he completed his surgical training in Leiden, London and France, and was greatly influenced by the establishment of the Academy of Surgery in Paris. And I think it's, it's frankly ironic. In this year of the gathering, which celebrates the achievements of the Irish diaspora, many of whom are here, your commitment and, and contribution to both Ireland and your host countries, that the founder of the Academy of Surgery in Paris was Georges Maréchal, surgeon to the King of France, son of Jean Maréchal, known in Ireland as John Marshall, one of the wild geese who, who fled the country, perhaps the earliest example. The college and surgeons campaigned for a charter. This was eventually granted in 1784 against considerable opposition. At the start, professors give their lectures in their own homes. They campaigned for a premises, and I think it resonates with the present, the comment and the reply they got from the Irish Parliament in 1789 in response to an appeal for funding. Um, despite that, uh, and with an income of 68 pounds, eight shillings and one and a half pence, they managed to spend 600 pounds leasing a building on Mercer Street, and in fact, buying the building across the alleyway. Because in the era of grave robbers, it was extremely important to have no neighbors overlooking you. Uh, <laughs> But based on the need for military and naval surgeons in the Napoleonic Wars, they eventually achieved a £6,000 grant from the government, which allowed them to build the first college seen here on St. Stephen's Green on the site of an old Quaker cemetery. And we today remain committed to St. Stephen's Green and the city centre, in part because we represent national bodies in surgery, radiology, dentistry, emergency medicine, sports and exercise medicine, and nursing. We are, this is the front of the college at York Street that we know so well. We are here in the 1970s building in this lecture hall. Here is what used to be the surface car park in your time, now the multi-story car park and a hotel leased to Travel Lodge. Across the road is the Bow Lane building, which houses part of our Population Health Sciences Department, but also is commercially leased to support the college. Here is the old Mercer's Hospital, which houses our Department of General Practice, looking after our, st our students and the inner city population, and the rest of it is a medical library. Around here is Millen House, student accommodation. On the other side of York Street to the front is 121. In many of our days, it was the Danish Embassy. It hosts our postgraduate surgical training department, administrative departments. Behind it, York House, our la proteomics lab and school of pharmacy. Behind that, the site fondly known in RCSI as the hole in the ground. Uh, more about it on. 
And here is Ardlawn Centre, which again is a commercial property about 11,000 square metres, which is designed as an endowment for the college and room for future expansion. We remain committed to expansion on the green, and this summer lodged planning permission for our new education and academic building, which would be 11 storey building, sorry, eight storey building, 11,000 square metres, totally devoted to education and training, high tech simulation labs, group study areas, gymnasium. This college, from the very beginning, as the president said, was, was aimed to establish a liberal and extensive system of education to proceed on non-sectarian lines for the public good and the advancement of the profession. This college, mainly because its founders were discriminated against themselves, has always been non-sectarian and tolerated all political views. Early examples, our first professor of surgery, William Deese, and future president of the college, was a United Irish man who committed suicide after the failure of the 1798 rebellion by cutting his own femoral artery. Historically interesting that it's marked on his statue at the front of the college by a crack on the exact place. Another president who kind of epitomizes the challenge for being a professional around the swirling currents of history is Sir Thomas Miles. I suspect the only president of the college to be mourned in the front page of Antoglach. Sir Thomas Miles was knighted for his efforts for the empire during the Boer War. At the start of the First World War, was made a lieutenant colonel in the British Army. And while all of us have heard about Erskine Childers running guns into Hoth on the Asgard, what very few people know is one week later, Sir Thomas Miles ran guns into Kilcool in Wicklow, helped by the McLaughlin brothers on the trawler Nugget from Hoth. In 1916, he found himself in the Richmond Hospital, treating with equanimity, innocent bystanders, and adversaries from both sides. I think he epitomizes the challenges for professionals in adversity. It used to be said that in Dublin, Dublin consultants could be distinguished be between those who went for tea in the drawing rooms of the mansion house versus those who went for tea in, the, in Dublin Castle. Yet despite being deeply politically divided, they work together in harmony in their hospitals and in their colleges. From the very beginning, the college has been committed to equality. It was the first medical school in the British Isles to graduate a lady, Miss Emily Dowson. It was the first college in the British Isles, and quite possibly the English-speaking world, to graduate a fellow in surgery, Emily Dixon, seen here operating in the Richmond Hospital. The Cecilia Street Medical School was the forerunner of the UCD Medical School, established by Cardinal Newman. At its beginning in 1855, they had no degree to give their students to allow them practice. The College of Surgeons allowed them to sit their exams and give them their degree. Furthermore, our president, Andrew Ellis, bought the first building. Cardinal Newman quipped that they would have never got the building if the sellers had known what it was for. <laughs> Nothing much changes in Ireland. Uh, in our CSI, because we are a focused health sciences institute, run and governed by clinicians and healthcare scientists, we've always been focused, understandably, in our core discipline and able to innovate. The series of firsts in Ireland and the British Isles go from chairs in surgery to midwifery, the first chair in preventative medicine in the British Isles in 1841, establishing chairs in anesthesia, and a series of postgraduate faculties. This has continued to the present day with an interest in tropical health, the first department of family medicine in the country, the first clinical research center built on a public hospital site in Beaumont in 2000, first online surgical education program, partnered with Harvard, the start of the graduate medicine, nurse prescribing program to allow nurses prescribe medicines under controlled circumstances, and then delighted to work with our colleagues in the PSI to establish an intern master's program for all pharmacy graduates in the country. And this year, due to launch an institute of pharmacy, which will be a continuous professional development platform for all pharmacists in the country. And it continues. When you look back and wonder, where does this interest in international education, RCSI, stem from? In my view, it stems from our founders, all of whom were trained internationally. It's deeply embedded in medical culture. There is hardly a specialist in Ireland who has not spent a significant period of time training overseas, nor indeed a scientist of substance similar. So it's in our culture. At the start, many students came from the UK by word of mouth 
from the Commonwealth, the first big influx of students, and many of you are here today, uh, came Asian students from South Africa in response to the bar for university education during the apartheid era, and we, we celebrate your success. And in 1960, the council made an interesting decision to go for a one-third, one-third, one-third policy, that one-third of our students would come from Ireland to create value where we live, one-third would come from the developing world, but interestingly, one-third would also come from the developed world. And the reason for the third from the developed world was to assure everybody that we were operating to the highest international standard, which was, I think, very far-sighted at the time in 1960. We are, and very much see ourselves, as an International Health Sciences Institute headquartered in Dublin. In our academic calendar, we take full cognizance of Easter, Ramadan, Diwali, and a whole series of national days. When an RCSI student in Dublin turns over their paper or opens their online assessment at 8 a.m. in Dublin, an RCSI student opens the same paper at 10 a.m. in Manama and at 3 p.m. in Kuala Lumpur. Every single one of our postgraduate committees and working groups have colleagues from overseas beaming in by VC. I think if, if every, we don't actually have an international office because international activity is core to everybody here, from IT to HR to estates to all our academic departments. I think if you are serious about international activity, it has to be core and central to your everyday work. It can't be some peripheral office that gets intermittent attention. It has to be central to what we do. The models of international education in Ireland that we use are either full programs in Ireland where students come to Ireland, twinning models where students spend their clinical years at home, which has much to be attractive about it because they learn in the clinical environment where they'll practice, full service models overseas, and then programs to support the developing world. But I think the minister is, is, is so right in what he says, both in the business world, and I also suspect in academia, we need to wonder what the customer wants. It is too tempting to give them what we think they want and think they need, but actually it's what they want that matters for long-term sustainability. There are many challenges in international education, many challenges. I don't think cultural sensitivity should be underestimated. Staff need specific training. The organization needs to remain ever vigilant, student feedback in other manners, because it can manifest itself in very subtle ways that we are rather blind to. As the minister said, and I think he is so right, to morally operate overseas, we need to be adding value locally to where we are, helping to build capacity. Quality is critical, as the University of Wales found out. If we are not offering a high quality experience, product, call it what you will, we have no business dealing with international students. Political stability is a challenge, and long-term institutional commitment is critical. When you make a decision to go overseas or engage with international students, you're not only taking your reputation, you're taking the national reputation with you. It never works out. It's never as easy as you thought it would be. Your local partners let you down, the environment changes. But once you make that step and that commitment, you have to see yourself as being there for the long term, irrespective of what happens. Too many colleges damage themselves and their national reputation, for example, in Dubai during the financial meltdown, when expats were abandoning their cars at airport car parks. Too many people pulled out. RCSI made an explicit decision that we were staying no matter what, and we would honor our commitments, and we made that clear to our local partners and colleagues. That kind of level of commitment and staying power is essential for Irish education to succeed overseas. At the heart of it all has to be quality. In RCSI, because of our unique mixture of professional courses, we really offer a, a triple lock on quality. We have our internal quality assurance processes. We welcome the legislation that will allow us to engage with QQI, both nationally and transnationally. We also engage with similar institutions in our overseas markets. And because we're a professional body giving professional degrees, we engage with all the professional bodies, such as the Medical Council, Irish Society of Chartered Physiotherapists, PSI, etc. So to give you an example, our medical program in Malaysia is accredited internally by RCSI, by the NUI, by the QQI, by the Irish Medical Council, by the Malaysian Medical Council, and by the Malaysian Qualifications Authority. Now, the Malaysian Qualifications Authority 
have given two six-star ratings to operations in Malaysia. We are one of them. Uh, it is an example of great inflation, but welcome nonetheless. <laughs> Political instability is, is a very serious challenge to anybody who operates overseas, and clearly not to talk about Bahrain would be, would be disingenuous. It has been a significant challenge for our college, and I'd like to acknowledge the support of the Minister of Education, the Department of Education's officials, the Taunishta, and the Department of Foreign Affairs, and the various embassies abroad. They have been stalwart uh, in their support and very wise in their advice. This arose in the context of the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring hit Bahrain in February 11. It was clear to us that our responsibilities, the things we could control, were the safety of our students and staff, our obligation to complete our educational mission, and to look at the long-term viability. Our first obligation being the first two. And I have tracked here the political events that happened in our response. Initially, when things took off, we maintained a close watching brief. When it was clear that things were deteriorating, our SMT, we moved on site. We focused on intelligence, trying to understand what was happening. We focused on developing contingency plans and particularly focused on clear, rapid, frequent communication with staff, students, and their families. During the next three months, this university went through the unique challenge of being closed twice and eventually evacuated. We were clear that our principal obligation was to graduate those doctors and nurses on time in that summer. Why? Firstly, as you would know as medical graduates, if, you don't, if you're not a summer graduate, it's a significant impediment to your career. And secondly, health services are dependent on a continuous flow of healthcare professionals coming into them. When we evacuated the university in March, we knew that we had to be back, or those students had to be back in hospitals by the 5th of April if they had any hope of graduating that summer. In Dublin, we developed a contingency plan with our colleagues in Dublin. Alternate accommodation, white coats, stethoscopes, tutors, rewrote a final med exam, hospital access. We were ready, if necessary, to repatriate those students to Dublin to graduate on them time, because irrespective of finance, and you can imagine what a loss leader that would have been, our obligation was to the education of those students. Our advance team in Bahrain, coming up to the 5th of April, saw a significant improvement in conditions and made a judgment that it was, po was possible to safely provide education in Bahrain from the 5th of April. By the 5th of April, the attendance of students in Bahrain was better than it was in Dublin. And to the credit of those students, and they have never really been credited by anyone, despite what they had to go through, they graduated on time. <coughs> and great credit to them for that. The issues that we had to deal with were harmony on our campus, that these were students coming from different political backgrounds. The focus was in education. Even amongst our staff, post-traumatic stress counselling, there was some frisson of concern because let's be honest, as we all know, there is no more paranoid group in the world than students approaching their final exams. There was a frisson of concern about examiner bias. With the collaboration and support of our colleagues in Dublin, we flew out external examiners, so that was just impossible. And these students graduated on time. And great credit to them and to my colleagues for making that work. Now, we have come under relentless criticism ever since and indeed before, for not being more strident political activists, not having a more strident advocacy role. And you can argue the merits of that, and as I have the stage, it would be wrong to protest too much. But a question we keep asking ourselves, and will continue to ask ourselves, and indeed the context can change, as an institution, can we contribute positively in this state, or does our presence in some way sustain the state or amount to complicity? And if we withdraw, will this benefit the human rights or the conditions of the people we're trying to help? And in truth and in conscience, my own view is as long as we are graduating doctors and nurses to a high quality, in a non-sectarian manner, we are adding value and we should stay. But not all would agree. In terms of student-specific issues, um, I think it's critically important to treat our students with respect. And remember, f from the very first point of contact, the admissions process is their first experience. Just as we judge a, a country by its airport, our students are judging us from their point of contact with our website and thereafter. And remember, 
of the high quality applicants to RCSI never make it through our door. But they all who have contact with us should leave with a high regard for Ireland and Irish higher education. We need to look at the admissions process. Safety is an issue. Uh, and we've developed with colleagues from the Institute of Technology in Tralee, and I'm delighted to welcome some of them here today, a medical commencement program to better serve and prepare these students for success who have challenges with basic science or English or English as applied to science. But safety, and the minister alluded to this, is a significant issue. And you'd be aware of the, how it went viral, the, 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 the allegations of Indian students being targeted in Australia. And in one year, the applications for student visas to Australia went down by 49%. This is a real issue that needs to be managed carefully. In our view, the way to deal with this is integrate our students into the society in which they're st studying. So they understand the people they serve, and also the people they serve understand them. We have an extensive reach operation, which is recreation, education, and community health, focusing on health in the community, particularly men's health, and focusing on the local inner city youth, homework clubs, explaining science, engaging them, exciting them in the science. Our ultimate target being to hold these kids in education to push them towards third level education. And I think as one of our own students said, every time when you're involved in any form of giving, you really get back so much more. And I think our students appreciate and understand that. And I think too, so does the local community. It's a, I don't think we can underestimate the challenge for students to come from relatively sheltered backgrounds and to do a professional course in a different language. None of us have ever been asked to do that. And it's critically important that we provide adequate language supports to set these students up for success. Many students come from sheltered backgrounds where there's a preference for rote learning, where there oftentimes is a cultural reluctance to defend your position, to engage in class, and perhaps a lack of critical thinking skills. To set these students up for success, we need to diagnose that early, intervene early, and support them. It is just not fair to not acknowledge this and support this. And many of our international students go on to great success. Who would have thought that Ara Darzi, who came here in 1978 from Baghdad High School as an Iraqi of Armenian origin, would today be Lord Ara Darzi, former Minister for Health in the UK, Chairman of Surgery at Imperial College. This is Zaid, a current student from Kuwait, in his report this year from the Mayo Clinic uh, on his elective. This is Daniel Joyce, a graduate from Ireland, because as the minister said, the international experience in RCSI also broadens the horizons of our Irish graduates. Daniel graduated from here, is a resident in Cleveland Clinic, and was voted by his peers out of 250 residents as resident of the year, which I think is a great credit to him. In the developing world, it poses particular challenges. When we think of the developing world, we tend to think of public health infectious disease. But surgical disease is a, is a significant burden in the developing world, and there is a significant under-provision of surgical care there. As you can see, all countries, I'm afraid including our own, take talented, trained healthcare professionals, doctors and nurses, out of the developing world to serve our own needs. And we need to address this in a different and innovative manner. My colleague Rory Brew and his colleagues in the Population Health Sciences Division have been studying this for some time, nurse migration, doctor migration. They've established unique programs, some with European Framework Grants, ZEST, which looks at providing surgical training to medical officers in Zimbabwe to improve surgical provision, and perhaps more controversially, COST, which looks at providing some basic surgical training to non-medics to improve surgical provision in that country. We've established a collaboration with COSEXA, the College of Surgeons of Southern Eastern Africa, and since then have set up about 25 IT labs, developed a unique African-centric e-platform, my colleague Professor Sean Tierney and others, and trained over 211 trainers in that country, training the trainers. And we're very pleased and delighted to expand that collaboration. I think, to pull it together, what are the lessons from our history? And uh, Jim Collins, the American academic, talks a lot about sustainable organizations. And in a 200-year-old organization, my colleagues and I spend a lot of time thinking about the next chapter in sustainability. I think the secret is to stick to your core principles, non-sectarian, public good advancement of the profession. No complacency, continually question, innovate, invest for the future, maintain our international perspective, advance science, the science of education of healthcare professionals and improved health outcomes. As Anya alluded to, in our 
recently launched strategy. We focus on education, international education, research, organizational capabilities, and partnerships. The partnership we value, our ships that we value, are with you, our alumni, you, our clinical colleagues, and the hospital network and healthcare markers, and also the university sector. And we're very pleased to collaborate with our colleagues in DCU and NUI Maynooth in the 3U partnership, the Greater Dublin Universities Alliance. One of the most exciting aspects of that partnership is here we have three institutions which have a particular focus on education, on pedagogy, and I think that will yield significant critical mass and opportunities. The photograph, in fact, shows our first graduates from the 3U partnership under the direction of Ruth Davis, our director. I will finish in this now by saying that the challenge for RCSI uh, is and always will be to provide value, to add value. Overseas students pay a premium to come to Ireland. They pay us a premium to go overseas. We have to be adding value. The day a graduate from a local university or an intern is not significantly better than a graduate from RCSI is the day we have no business being there. I have confidence for the future, mainly because I'm lucky to live in an organization with extraordinary staff. And while praise for me doesn't mean a lot, I think the comments from Dame Leslie Southgate in one of our last external reviews says it all, when she talks about the enthusiasm, the commitment to improving quality, excellent team working. I think that is what will allow us rise to the challenge of the future. So I'd like to thank you, Minister, for your support. And again, welcome all of you, and I hope you have a very enjoyable weekend.